been in Austin for 11 years, uh, enough to start to feel like I'm, I'm at home in Austin. It's where I'm from, even though I grew up in a different place. Uh, I see Texas as uh, my home. And um, I've been doing soft Python and software for 20 years, uh, kind of a long time. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And I've been interested over the past couple of years in the growth of the AI ML movement and kind of what it means in terms of software architecture, software development, some of the really awesome things that are happening, some of the challenges that brings to us you know, developers and people trying to make sense of the world and trying to build systems that use these great technologies. Um, this is one timeline I put up that might be of interest to some of you. It's sort of on the top is where I've been, uh, kind of at these different moments in life uh, from 1991 till today, 2018. And I started my Python career actually at the Mayo Clinic where I was doing work on, I'll talk a little about that later, but I was working on just trying to make uh, medical imaging work and doing software development, basically, a whole lot of, so I, I kind of consider myself to be a, a scientist at heart. And I got into tool building because of the desire to make better tools for scientists, because the tools that were there weren't really that great. And then as I started to explore this, I realized that part of the problem is actually the computer scientists don't understand the scientists very well. You know, they solved the problem at Lambda Calculus and Lisp in the, 18, in the 50s, and everything else is an exercise for the reader. Uh, but the exercise for the reader actually turns out to matter, and there are some actual problems that weren't solved and haven't been solved and really start to matter. And I've learned that part of it kind of later in, in my career. I started as a, as a professor, did that for a while, and then I started companies in 2007. I just gave a talk at PyDid in New York. And if you get a chance to look at the video recording, you can go watch that because there I kind of was pretty honest and transparent about my view around really needing companies in order to make open source work and kind of some of the explorations and, and work I've been trying to do in that space since 2007. So, and that's all happened in Texas, basically. I came here, worked at a consultancy, then started Anaconda as a company, again, to try to bring more money to open source. That was, that was the reason I put up with the effort and, and energy of starting a company. I didn't really start my life thinking I would start companies, but in graduate school, I learned what entrepreneurship meant for a free economy, learned that it was critical to have entrepreneurs, and so then, it's kind of went away for me to channel my open source enthusiasm as I've gotten older to helping entrepreneurs, helping people build companies around open source. And that's, uh, that'll keep me busy for the, hopefully the next 10, 20, 50 years, probably not 50. <laughs> um, but then below is kind of this weird, this interesting timeline. A lot of people don't recognize, don't realize, they kind of come to the space where, oh, it's Jupiter and it's PyTorch and it's, the, and it's TensorFlow. They don't realize, well, it was actually 10 years ago that NumPy showed up, right? And NumPy was actually a product of another 10 years of development in Python land. And this has been happening for a long, long time, actually, 20 years of development. And there's a lot of acceleration of this happening, but a lot of the lessons learned for the past 20 years haven't been applied. And we're actually having to, there, there's sort of new mistakes and new technical debt being put into the systems we're building today because we're not sharing information across enough people. That's one of the things I hope to be able to do. So I've been involved in some of these projects. Some of you know me from SciPy. That was really my baby. I got started because I really wanted to bring to the world uh, open source libraries for doing data analysis. And SciPy was this collection. I learned a lot from SciPy. I learned kind of principles of human behavior and how it's hard to have a big project with too many things it's doing and how do you actually do open source at scale. And I've learned a lot over the past 20 years. And um, the three of us kind of organized some of the work I was doing in 95, 98. Uh, and pulled SciPy together. And some, some people know me for that. It's now a big project. More know me from NumPy. NumPy was a thing I, I did because I was worried about the fork that was happening in the community. And now that's 694 contributors. Uh, a lot more people kind of know me for Anaconda. It's actually 7 million Anaconda users now. It keeps growing. Uh, that's an estimate, but it's uh, very popular. It's a local company. The, Peter and I founded that in 2012. It's now led by uh, CEO Scott Collison who's here in town and doing a great job, uh, helping to take this small little incubated company and then grow it uh, and expand it to a, a powerful enterprise software company. Super excited by it. Some of you know me for NumFocus. NumFocus was the same time we created Anaconda, also wanted to create a nonprofit, essentially to try to help, again, organize open source ecosystems. And NumFocus has also grown. It has a new board just selected this year. And it was done in conjunction with uh, Fernando Perez and John Hunter and Perry Greenfield and Jared Millman, who were involved in some of the rest of these communities, and we were the first board. And then Peter Wang also helped us. Essentially, we, we, we direct, redirected investor money from Continuum into NumFocus. And for the first couple of years, really spent, like founded, like made NumFocus work. Um, it is now on its own and separated from, from Anaconda, but that couldn't have happened without the support of Peter and Continuum Analytics. 
Um, now, at Continuum, I had this great opportunity and, and something I really, really was passionate about uh, for a long, long time, still am very passionate about, this community innovation group at Continuum where we built teams that constructed Numba and Dask and Bokeh and Jupyter Lab and, and then helped PyViz, which is continuing on with HVPlot and Panel. It's actually a very, very productive team, something I'm super proud of. And that's kind of the energy I'm trying to grow more of. And kind of some of the energy we learned how to do at Continuum, we recognize the value of that incubation energy and, and generating new ideas, generating open source communities, and that's what we're continuing. So there's a lot of power here, actually. And when I go places, people still haven't heard of Numba. They still not haven't heard of DAS. So these are still early stages. Like you saw before, SciPy, oh, you know NumPy. Well, great, did you know it was written 10 years ago? Did you know it was 2006 when it came out? A lot of people don't recognize these open source communities, they don't show up and explode in a year. Like literally, my timeline, my time horizon for successful open source is 18 months, and that's really successful. If you have like the most successful open source project, it's gonna take 18 months before anyone knows about you, anyone. And then, you know, kind of over the next three, five years is when you know whether you're really making it or not. And so that's, that's, that's repeated itself over and over again. So I'm doing something now different. I've spun out of Anaconda, part of kind of turning Anaconda over to a more prof kind of a uh, professional CEO, uh, somebody who can actually have an experience scaling a company, an enterprise software company, which Anaconda has become. Um, I get to now continue the innovation work we were doing at Continuum. Kind of, uh, and our theme is we build and connect companies and communities, really around the challenging problems with data, around this whole data science ecosystem, getting data to producing decision actions from those data. Uh, so this is also continuing my quest to enable paying open source developers. Um, I got started with business and open source to figure out how to fund NumPy and SciPy. I'm still trying to figure that out. NumPy and SciPy still need funding. They're basically a bunch of volunteers supporting a stack used by millions. And I don't think people recognize the, the infrastructure problem we're facing, where they have all this dependent code and there's nobody maintaining it except for a few nights and weekends from a couple of people. Um, there are two people now working on NumPy full-time, but we want to change that so we get a team of 15 working on SciPy and NumPy at, in, in the future. It'll take us a couple of years, but that's one of the goals. So at, at, at Quonsight, that's what we're doing now. We're sort of taking these other elements of the Anaconda model, the continuum analytics model, and uh, created Quonsight to effectively create new spin-outs. Anaconda is the first spin-out of Continuum. And I think of it as the first spin out of, of Quonsight, but officially that's not true. But that's kind of the way I think about it. <laughs> Anaconda was the first spin out we created. And uh, we're, we're looking to spin out others and help incubate other open source companies and help them become large and uh, successful. Uh, so our core business, and I, I paid for your pizza, so you have to listen to me say this a little bit. <laughs> right, so uh, our core business is uh, Quonsight Labs memberships, sustainable open source partnerships, custom data science ML consulting. Uh, kind of help you use the open source tools. And then we add a staffing mentoring part. Partly, I've done open source consulting for 20 year, for 10 years, 12 years, right? And what I recognize is you can try to sort of corral your consultants and hope nobody touches them. I've instead embraced the opposite. I'm gonna go embrace and find as many people to funnel through this opportunity as possible and place them. And, and we may have a thousand people go through Quonsite over the next 10 years and be always kind of 75 to 100 people. So that's, we're just embracing the staffing, mentoring, and training part of our business. And that really is a, a sustainable whole that also couples with our rest of our goals. So we do consulting, if you're interested in the consulting we can do, or partnering on this consulting, or even have being people we can give, send work to, let me know. Uh, we're, we do have a consulting business around AIML, Jupyter Everywhere. If you haven't seen Jupyter Lab, you need to check it out, because most of the software you write can be rewritten as plugins to Jupyter Lab, and you can save yourself millions of dollars. And uh, Python optimization. A lot of people have very bad Python code out there in, de in deployment, and you just a little bit of tweak can make it run faster and save you money. So we do a lot of we do uh, work in helping people do those things. We have this kind of novel concept called sustainable open source partnerships, where which are basically statements of work to help you get the features you need out of open source communities. Open source communities are this kind of amorphous group of people doing a lot of stuff that they don't care about your business. We're kind of that glue that cares about your business and helps the open source communities level up. Uh, you know, you might need feature requests. We're solving the problem of, I've gone to lots of Fortune 100, Fortune 5000 companies. What they do is they spend millions of dollars essentially fighting open source communities. Hey, I got this internal project. Well, did you bother to talk to the open source community that's around this? Oh, no, I just decided to do it myself. Great. Well, I hope that works out for you. You know, $10 million later, they're still behind. They're maintaining themselves. The open source community's moved on. So we said, look, there's an opportunity here. Let's help companies connect what they're trying to do with open source communities. And we do a two-way thing. We help communities publicize their roadmaps, 
kind of up level their conversations. They're communicating in a way that people can look and say, oh yeah, that's gonna help me. And then we provide statements of work, projects that we provide, help we provide, accountability effectively. Accountability to um, getting the things done and put into open source that you need. You can hire from the community. The best way to hire is to do great work and then attract people to that great work. And then, then it turns out you can find good people to work on. So you can hire from the community and then get open source support. And recently we've been adding this question of for larger companies particular, particularly, they struggle with internal siloization. They struggle with internal people not talking to each other. So how do we apply the lessons of open source communities to help bigger companies actually um, understand each other and make sure they're not repeating the wheel 15,000, 15 or 15,000 sometimes times, actually have a uh, cross. So is it tools, is it lessons, is it applicability, maybe it's the construction of core teams, governance models, kind of applying the lessons of open source to large company interactions. So those are all things we do. Great, sales pitch, here's some stuff you ought to be listening to that I think you might find interesting. Open Source Directions, a webinar, we help the communities organize their roadmaps and we help them get on stage and present themselves to the world. So this is a, a currently it's bi-weekly, eventually we'd like to get it to be a weekly webinar where peop, uh, open source developers and open source communities get on and talk about what they're working on and their roadmap and publicize it. And those, the record of those transcripts and the recordings are available. Open Source Directions, it's a free webinar series. And then we have this effort called Quantsight Labs. This is really, I'm really excited about this effort because this is my answer to how am I going to help the NumPy sci-fi ecosystem migrate to the 20, 20th century, actually to Python 3 land. Later, if you're interested, I'll go into detail about why NumPy and SciPy are actually Python 1 technologies. And we're on Python 3 already, right? So there's a lot of work that has to be done to actually up-level those, those libraries and get them into the modern era. It's an effort we're going to engage with in Quantsite Labs. So Quantsite Labs goes to companies and says, let's cooperate on this. Shared, shared open, open source is shared research and development. So great, here's a lab where you can actually fund and then get some benefits for your funding. But fundamentally, you're helping maintain and sustain the future while also getting access to people. And so we're partnering with NumFocus, we're partnering with Ursa Labs, which is Wes McKinney's work around Aero. It's very, um, very similar. Not, it's not the same, but it's, it's collaborative. We have a lot of collaborative work. So it's all around the this Python data science ecosystem, helping improve NumPy, helping improve the NumPy ecosystem, helping connect the NumPy ecosystem to machine learning frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow, improving GPU support, improving support to ensure FPGAs can work or modern new hardware can work, improve, uh, so Jupyter Lab improvements and extensions for Jupyter Lab, data catalog standards. There's a num like this is just a small list of the whole ecosystem and our goal is to get to $20 million of funding from government sources, from companies, in five years. I mean, next, if we can get to five million by end of next year, we're doing awesome. Uh, so if you're interested or know people who are interested or who I should be talking to to pitch this to your company, let me know. We're, we're really pushing to get industry support for open source in a really uh, fundamental foundational way. All right, some of the projects we're working on. Uh, Arrow is one. Uh, Arrow is a, is a standard data science frame, a data frame. It's a standard data frame. It's one approach, it's great approach. It's helping to kind of consolidate the Java world and the Python world. I love this project because of that. And it's a cross-platform development platform, cross-language cross development platform for memory data, particularly data frame data. So we also have a project called XND, which is a uh, project that enables, it's NumPy refactored. It's taking the concepts that allow NumPy to work and making those concepts available as libraries so that other languages can do the same. Node, Ruby, Java. So some people go, well, that sounds a lot like Arrow. It does conceptually, but the differences are in the focus. So Arrow is to pandas as XND is to NumPy. So just like pandas is the data frame, NumPy is the array structure, XND is kind of the generalization of NumPy, Arrow is the generalization of pandas. So we're working on this kind of how do we take these concepts broader. And then this new idea just, just occurred, and this is just, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about some of the problems with machine learning. This URA concept, and this is just started as a project. Don't go try to download it and try to de depend on it for your production system by the end of the year. Please don't, no seriously, don't. <laughs> There's, however, if you're interested in this problem and want to help us fund it, and instead of you doing another version like this, kind of work with us and we'll build something that will be useful for everybody. Uh, this URA concept is really trying to part of the up-leveling of the NumPy sci-fi ecosystem. And it's not just, it's not really just here's a new NumPy, it's really here's a new way to write a sci-fi ecosystem, to write an NumPy ecosystem. Here's a new way to think about array computing in a world where you've got multiple backends. Um, and I can go into more detail. There's a couple of, I mean, I've talked about the Python 1 problem of NumPy, and we can go into detail about that for those interested. It's also the string bytes problem. You've heard of that, pro that problem in Python? So this problem showed up in Python 2 in the Python 3 conversion, 
I'm really, really um, looking forward to the fact we won't take as long as Python 3. Part of that is because it's a big, a big problem, but not as big as the string bytes problem. Python 2 confused strings and bytes. So when you were in Python 2 land and you wanted a string, you did the same thing that you did when you wanted a series of bytes. So a string is like textual. It's like, I'm going to write a text. I'm going to talk to someone. I'm, so a human's going to interpret this. Bytes is I just want character. I just want bits that a computer's going to interpret. And in Python 2, they were both the same. Your string and was, it was represented as bytes, and there was no differentiation between them. Unicode, so when Unicode came around, there was this extra Unicode object, but it was kind of, okay, I had to do this separately. It wasn't, it wasn't the same thing. So we have the same problem in ArrayLand. We have a logical array. Is, there's no really way to talk about a logical array. There's no con common way. So somebody in SciPy or somebody in Scikit-Learn or somebody in AstroPy or any of the stack around NumPy can't talk about an array unless they're talking about a strided pointer or a pointer to memory. Like that's the only way to talk about an array. And that's a fine representation of a kind of array, but it's not the only way to think about arrays. And so you can't really differentiate in SciPy land, do I care that I have a pointer to data? And that's my, I'm really concerned about that because sometimes I might be. Or do I really just want a logical concept called an array that I can then do math on? And there's no way to differentiate that currently. And so that's kind of the, the big picture is to fix that problem. Um, that's what we're working on. We also work on JupyterLab. And uh, who's, who's seen JupyterLab in the audience? Good, okay. Those who haven't raised their hand, go home today and check out JupyterLab. Uh, JupyterLab is definitely ready for users. It's definitely ready for you to write plugins. And if you have a, a process at work where you've got some web UI they built around notebooks, especially if you're using notebooks, you're thinking how to upgrade your notebooks, and up-level your notebook integration, they've already solved the problem. You just need to write an extension to JupyterLab probably to connect what you're doing to that, to that world. Uh, and it's ready to go. It's 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 really nice project. Visualization. It's been a key part of bringing. Like arrays don't matter unless you have unless you can visualize them. Um, you know everybody who's done a programmer has the hello world. Print hello world. Is what you do right? How, what's the print hello world of of NumPy? Like do you really just stream a list of numbers to your screen? Right. You can I guess, but nobody would care. What you do is you visualize it. Right, so visualization, that's why it's been so, par so much a part of array computing, because you've got to see it. And there's an, an unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, showing the robustness of the Python ecosystem, there's a tremendous number of visualization techniques and approaches. They're somewhat related to each other. Uh, Altair, Bokeh are two approaches that we really like. I really like the PyViz, and I'll show the panel stuff that we're, that, that's just come out of the team doing PyViz. Uh, a little bit um, in the next slide, actually. Panel is easy dashboards. So Bokeh already gave you the ability to do dashboards. Bokeh gives you a, a shiny for Python capability called Bokeh Server that is quite powerful. Panel gives makes it even easier. Panel is kind of a way to construct in the browser as well as in, in JupyterLab and as an independent server dashboards from any kind of widget. So now it's not just Bokeh, it's also uh, Seaborn and Matplotlib and Plotly. You can incorporate any kind of plotting backend, Altair backend, but organize them together into a single application pretty easily. So this is uh, called Panel. It's fairly new, just come out, but panel.pyviz.org, you can definitely check it out. And we're eager to support this work as well. Uh, we have folks at Quantsite that work on the ContaForge community. ContaForge is the community-driven package management uh, story. Uh, that's fully supported by Anaconda. Uh, Anaconda is a, a partner with the ContaForge community. This is community-led collection of recipes. This is basically the, uh, the there's a thousand people making their, ver their stuff available for uh, ContaForge. It's not just people in Anaconda making Conda packages. It's a great community. It shows you how to build. Uh, and they're, fortunately, they're, they initially, earlier this year, had different compilers than the Anaconda was using for its compilers. So there's basically a, a mismatch between packages compiled with ContaForge and packages compiled for Anaconda. So you had to really be careful to separate your usages. That's that, that problem is going away. By you know, early next year, I, I, that problem will be gone. Uh, today, you do have to just be a little careful to make sure if you have binary dependencies that you know who compiled them and, and which compiler flags were, were in place. Uh, the other thing we do at, at uh, Quonsight is we incubate young companies. That's an important people piece of what we do, actually. We are excited that we have, we have a venture fund that we're just starting called Quantsite Initiate. And this fund basically uh, invests and helps young companies get off the ground. Uh, Open Teams is one that we're like go looking to spin out next year as an incubated company. Auto Auto is a new company that we just started. They're here in the audience, actually, over here, Ryan and, and Joy. Super excited by that. Uh, great company. And then uh, Open Source Answers, another company that we're doing some work with incubating these young companies. I'm really super excited to extend the notion of 
open source t community innovation with how to help companies uh, grow and, and help, um, help a place at least for some of the learning that I can at least uh, answer or be somewhat helpful. I don't know all, th all things, but I've certainly learned a lot of, made a lot of mistakes and learned a bunch of things and trying to grow uh, several companies from the early stages to something that investors would take a hard look at. Um, open Teams, definitely check it out. Only to give you feedback though. It's really not ready for you to kind of use in anger, but give us feedback as to how you might think better things you could use, better things could be done, better approaches could be taken. Open Teams is a way to collaborate and find open source uh, developers who want, you want to work with, want to work for you, uh, want to coordinate with. And more to come on Open Teams in the coming year. All right, so that's kind of a, people ask me what I'm doing now, there you go. Now you know what I'm doing now is, is kind of all those things. <laughs> it's really going back to the roots of what made Continuum work and re-energizing that effort, um, which we can do because Anaconda is now working. Uh, so very, I'm very excited to help other people figure out how to make those same transitions. Now let's talk about AI and ML. And kind of this is what gets me excited about, uh, it actually is where the U-Array idea came from, is taking a hard look at the ML landscape and the Python landscape and saying, well, what now? What can we possibly do? What's going on? And frankly, back in March, being somewhat frustrated looking at that and going, this is a mess. I can't believe we got here. There's so many smart people, what happened? Uh, I guess everyone just decided to go off on their own and try to reinvent the world and not cooperate. And yeah, that's, there's some of that for sure. And that's gonna happen. But AI is everywhere. Part of it is the popularity. Like the, in, the number of people who have come to Python is just enormous compared to where, it was, where it's been. I often feel like you, know, you could ex understand the Python ecosystem pre-2016 as kind of these, uh, the personal stories of about 10, maybe 12, 15 people. That is no longer true, right? We sort of have, we had this uh, uh, local farm, we had the back 40 we were farming with our plow and with our, maybe our, our, you know, we were excited about that John Deere we bought down at the lot. And then today we got mechanized farming. Big Ag has rolled in next door and they're farming the back 40, the, the back 4,000. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is a different story we're in now. How do, we, how do we play with this newer world? And it's exciting, but it also presents some interesting uh, challenges because it presents challenges for the newcomer to Python because you'll see a lot of messaging effectively from a, a view that's the person farming their back 40. And then kind of another set of people who are just pushing on features and not really in a coherent way, not in a way that you're not sure what's going to happen. Is that feature set going to be accepted? Are people going to use MXNet tomorrow? Great, I'm relying on MXNet. Is anybody else? Who knows? That's a good question. And, and uh, the developers of MX, MXNet would probably like you to, but then the same question could be asked of PyTorch or TensorFlow. We'll talk about a little bit about some. Now the reason is because AI has finally entered the public consciousness with applications that work, right? The year, there's been years, I mean, AI has been around for a long, long time. And there's a, a few of you who are a little older than I am who have also been aware of AI since when you were, when you were around. This is what got excited, people got excited about this in the 1950s. Right, the possibility of machines replacing humans. Why now is it suddenly much better? And I think it's because of the availability of data and then the availability of compute. Um, but you know, don't, don't, don't be alarmed. We, I am definitely in the camp of somebody, we are not close to singularity. Uh, if you're worried about the singularity, I, uh, I, have a, I, have a little I have a child who worries a lot and I have to talk to him about things to worry about, things not to worry about. <laughs> Uh, singularity is not something for you to worry about right now. There's other things to be worried about, believe me, but singularity, that's, yes, we're gonna have to address that at some point, but I don't even know what the world's gonna look like at that point, so I don't like to speculate. It's a lot like, we're gonna be able to, like, what's the weather gonna be like on Mars when we get there? <laughs> uh, good question, but we're not, I don't have to worry about that, nor, nor will you or your children. So, but what you will have to worry about is how do I apply these really cool models that train things, that, that can basically mimic some aspects of, of human um, cognition? like some small aspects of human cognition, they can. So what does that mean for me? I can actually automate a lot of things. A lot of things I used to think couldn't be automated, now they can be automated. If you can basically think about how, how to put a black box together that has data in and answer out, that could be automated. If you have enough data to train it and enough patience and enough compute power and enough ingenuity to figure out how to tweak all the parameters you have to tweak to make it work in practice, which is, can be a lot. So this, this was really cool. I love this because I was a medical imaging student at Mayo Clinic and I was surrounded by doctors who were kind of worried at the time about being replaced by machines. They didn't have to worry then, they still don't have to worry. Um, but they were worried about kind of machines taking over and part of it was, oh man, these machines can't possibly do what you're doing. But now they kind of can for some parts of their job. If you're just staring at images, trying to decide whether it's, trying to screen a bunch of images to see whether I should look further or not, 
a computer can do that now. And actually to the same degree that a trained dermatologist could. To get these data though, like if you look deeper, there are a lot of labeled data. There's a lot of manual labor went into this. It was not something, oh, we did this in a couple of afternoons and cool, we had our business working. There was a lot of manual labor, a lot of grad students, a lot of labeled images. Um, it's still a lot of work to get that kind of sensitivity. Uh, kind of your out of the box sensitivity, if you sort of take data, throw it at a machine learning algorithm and make it work, you're probably gonna get maybe 60%, 75%, maybe 75% if you're really lucky, specificity. Like, great, and, and, but to get more, you're gonna have to work harder. To get more, you're gonna have to work harder on your data, fig your feature selection, on your filtering of the data. Uh, and I've seen that repeatedly with a number of different projects. So it's possible, but there's work still. Um, and people are trying to automate that work, and I have some hope that that automation will start to work over the next uh, five years. Uh, Python keeps growing. I think part of the reason is because all of that work that's necessary. Like, it's not just here's a GUI. Uh, I know when I was getting funding for Anaconda, there were a number of venture firms who were basically like trying to fund the automatic easy button for AI. It's still happening, but it was happening then too. Like, where's your easy button for AI? I'm like, what, because I don't want to sell you smoke and mirrors? Uh, it doesn't exist. What exists is I can enable people to make them more powerful. What I can do is get your smart people and make them more powerful with a tool like Python that enables rapid iteration and kind of gets out of their way so they're your smart people can be better at what they're doing. And that's kind of what's caught on with Python, is people recognize, oh yeah, all this stuff around the AI problem that I need to do, it's transferring data from here, integrating the data, sys data system with that data system, pulling this over here, a lot of scripting work to do. And then, oh, what do you know, there's all these machine learning libraries that are connected. So all that work, I end up with data structures I can just hand over, it's just an API call. I just call another function. That's pretty cool. I don't have to do some work and then do some more work. Right, to, I, I've just given an errand to the data scientist. I actually just, oh, just add another function call here and then everything's working. That's pretty cool. But it's been kind of, it's been the Pandas effort that's enabled that to help make easy data access. It's been the scikit-learn effort to make machine learning accessible to mortals. Uh, that's been a tremendous work. And then it's been the Jupyter work, kind of on top of all the stuff that I spent a lot of time on. So it's the ecosystem that matters. I mean, that, that lesson alone is enough to say I, was, I, I did, had no idea this would be possible with some of the things we started. And it wasn't possible alone. It wasn't possible with what I was doing. It was possible because you enabled people. Possible because you enabled a group to do something you didn't imagine the first time, the first place. And so that, uh, that's a lot of what drives me is how do I make possible what I'm not imagining yet? Um, and that's what I like to be involved with. Uh, so actually, I like this trend because it shows that and this isn't popular with everybody, but it does show that Python is more popular than Java, finally. <laughs> now, I know people, this is a broader meeting, big data AI meetup, there's some Java people here, that's fine. I like Java, I'm actually a polyglot. I'm not a language bigot, I like a lot of languages. I just didn't like how there were Java, Java bigots, actually. <laughs> and there, there are a lot of them I met, kind of, no, if it's not Java, it's not worth anything. Well, okay, I mean, Java's great, it has its, really, it has its, its, its good points, but it's also got its bad points. Python's great, it's got its good points, it's also got its bad points. Let's talk about them, let's talk about how to work together. Uh, so, like every other team, together we do much more than individuals. Um, so I, I feel that way about languages. So, and most people resonate that with that, except for my Julia friends today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I love Julia, Julia's a great language, but they're kinda on the, we're gonna be the one language rule them all kick, which like, oh, we, got, we gave that up years ago, and, and you probably should too already. Um, <laughs> And you might actually get some usage because it's a really cool tool for a lot of, uh, a lot of use cases. Um, but not, it's not gonna run your entire data center, I guarantee you. That, that I can predict with 100% confidence. Um, so I show this slide because I, you know, it's, it's really hard, even after being in the community, that, to re realize just how diverse and big it is, right? Because you know, we really struggle as humans to understand this many brands. Right, it's actually what marketers know and why they keep getting inundated with ads because they're trying to capture your limited attention span. Uh, we all have it. To try to get you to use your, your short-term memory to think about their company. So when we get, and, and the open source ecosystem is actually for human dynamics to work at scale. It's actually multiple groups. So we have an immediate problem of this different between how do I have, we work together best as small teams, but we think about consumption with single brands. Right, and that's kind of this fundamental problem between open source and, and usage. That, you know, there's an opportunity for Anaconda in the middle of that, it turned out, uh, to kind of be a brand that pulled it all together, but there's a lot here. And so um, you have to kind of be aware of that, that there's, prob there's more here than you're aware of. And every day, I, I mean, I am struggling to keep up 
And I've been doing this for 20 years and very detail aware of what's going on. And I'm like, holy cow, I don't know how anybody keeps up with this. <laughs> it's really tough. Uh, every day I see another project that's really cool. Uh, and then some that aren't cool, actually. You can see those too. <laughs> so um, Python data now, this is the timeline again. This is just one, you know, this is just really kind of my timeline. This is the things I've cared about. Every one of you could write a, could do a timeline. Other people do a timeline, be even bigger. What's happened recently, so you notice down here, it was kind of this nice little garden we were growing. And then in 2015, all of a sudden, a lot of stuff started to happen. And we had this explosion of Torch, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Chainer, MXNet, just explode onto the scene. And kind of, you know, I, I wasn't even aware of all these things pretty, and all of a sudden they were there, and all of a sudden they were useful, and all of a sudden they were, and then you, you dig into the details and realize, oh yeah, the company is spending tens of millions of dollars on funding these things. So yeah, there's probably a lot there that's worth doing, worth looking at. They are building on um, the tools that have already been there in the, in the past, but they're not necessarily integrating with as effect effectively. Now there are, there is some consolidation here. So TensorFlow Keras, Keras is a API on top of TensorFlow. I actually never talk about Keras in the same breath as I talk about TensorFlow and PyTorch. And the reason is not because I don't love Keras, I love Keras. It's because Keras is an API. TensorFlow is like a library, runtime. In fact, Keras is the right API to use TensorFlow. If you're using TensorFlow and not using Keras, you're doing it wrong. And you should stop right now. And you'll, your engineers in the future will love you um, because the TensorFlow API by itself in Python is really bad. Um, but Keras is, is, is decent. And they've actually made some real strides over the past little while. PyTorch and Cafe2. Cafe2, Facebook has a bunch of production mo models in production with Cafe2, but they've just finished the migration of Cafe2, the integration of Cafe2 to PyTorch. They're merging those two. So some consolidation going on uh, right now. And Chainer is actually, it's the one I like to talk about because it's kind of the one that, that, that participated with the Python ecosystem <laughs> instead of trying to over, you know, kind of redo it. <laughs> the Chainer folks, they actually built on top of NumPy. They actually built on top of SciPy. They added with the pieces that were necessary. Now, I, there's a lot of reasons why you know, Torch and TensorFlow couldn't necessarily do that. But I like to talk about Chainer because it's, it's, very, it's good. It works. It works on top of the tools that are there. It's also the number two machine learning library in Japan. The challenge with Chainer is it's written by a Japanese company. It's used in production a lot, but the documentation is, is in English, but the user stories and the videos and the people that tell you how to use it are all Japanese. <laughs> They're working on that. They're really trying to work on that because it's got some really cool tools and useful, useful um, activities there. Microsoft CNTK, um, we'll talk, it's, we'll talk a little more about that, and MXNet we'll talk a little more about too. Okay, so ML frameworks, what do they do? These, you've seen, most of you have seen this kind of thing. Machine learning frameworks are a big nonlinear, um, non-parametric modeling. Uh, non-parametric is really a funny word for like, when you have like two parameters or 10 parameters, it's called parametric. When you have a million, it's called non-parametric. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but that's kind of way, that's what that's it works. When you have a lot of parameters, they call it non-parametric. I think it's because you know, when you have a few parameters, you've got like this specific model, and you're trying to fit the parameters of that model. A non-parametric model says, I got the, a generic set of model parameters, and so I have a generic thing. So um, these neural networks basically create a general nonlinear uh, modeling tool. You can basically model a nonlinear function. And nonlinear functions are pretty cool because they mean if I have an input, whatever it might be, but I can define it, and I have an output, whatever it might be, but I can define it, I can train a model to predict output from input. And it's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty cool concept. So if I've got images and I want to label them, that's a nonlinear function. If I've got audio data and I want to get translated to text, that's a nonlinear function. If I've got faces I want to recognize in a crowd, that's a nonlinear function. I can train any nonlinear function. That's, that's the idea. So anything you can think of that's a mapping between things I know about, things I care about, I can build a, um, I have these general purpose models. Uh, it's like linear modeling, but it really isn't much different from regression, except for a whole lot more parameters and a whole lot more complexity because of those lot of parameters. And then a whole lot of mystery, actually, still, about why in the world does this work? Why if I find a million, you know, all these, all these model parameters that work? But it seems to, and it seems to do with the, something with the scale, something to do with the, um, uh, the breaking it down at different levels, and it's kind of related to what our brains do, but only really peripherally, not specifically, but, but, but peripherally it is. So every machine learning library, you know, I kind of, um, NumPy actually provides an array. They call them tensors now. I'm not sure why, but they do. 
and I have to deal with that. <laughs> I'm going to counseling. Um, <laughs> tensors are a mathematical thing. Arrays are a, are a computer science thing, but they call them tensors, but okay. But you need them fundamentally in, because a machine learning model is a big, these, every one of these nodes is like a big matrix multiply to, to basically do the linear add between all these weights and the parameters uh, feeding into the node. And then you add a little bit of nonlinearity. That's basically a, whole, a big pipeline of array functions. And that's what NumPy was built for, was to build, allow you to build pipelines of array functions and make that very easy to do. Now, what we didn't have in NumPy was a very easy way to calculate the derivatives, an automatic differentiator. So to build the derivative, which is necessary for estimating the loss function, you'd have to either estimate it, uh, estimate it by uh, differences or derive it by hand. And so what, a lot of pe what people did is bring automatic differentiation to array computing big part of what was needed for these frameworks. Really super interesting. Then the other thing is actually the ability to um, use GPUs. Right? Those are the two things that are missing from NumPy, basically. GPU support and differentiability, kind of automatic differentiation. Um, for inference, and all of these things are basically there. I think the, 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 the red highlights what was missing from the NumPy stack. And then for inference, inference is just the idea of applying the model. Training is figuring out the weights. Inference is just using the model to predict. And they're starting to be talked about differently because in hardware, you have to have more hardware for the training than you do for inference. And you can do inference on the edge, whereas you can't really do training on the edge necessarily, or it's, it's a little bit different. A lot of your phones work because it's just inference. They're just applying a model instead of trying to do um, a big computation for the training. All right, so let's look at some of the statistics of these projects. These were recorded August 15th. I haven't updated them since. Um, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Chainer, PalPal, CNTK, and Theano, right? There are more. There really are more. But I, I have actually, I think TensorFlow and PyTorch and Chainer. MXNet, if you're really an Amazon junkie, but I, don't, I see MXNet as an example that we're going to learn from, but I don't, I don't see it going very far. They're kind of going to, but I think TensorFlow and PyTorch are going to have legs, and I think Chainer already has legs. So I think those three are going to exist. Um, TensorFlow is the dominating the stars game, right? It's dominating the, people, the awareness game. Most people are aware of TensorFlow. PyTorch is particularly, uh, people are aware of it in the academic communities. And over this past year, people are starting to understand that, oh, PyTorch is a little more open source, community driven, a little more in the spirit of, um, of kind of broad open source appeal. <laughs> TensorFlow is, uh, kind of a one company driven, but it's, but it's Google. I mean, Google's a pretty cool company, so they've got a lot of engineers working on it. So um, there's a lot of energy around, around TensorFlow. Um, participants, there's a contributors. Participants are people that made GitHub issues or you know participated in some conversation on GitHub. So you can see that it's by far the largest community, the largest number of people interested in TensorFlow. This blew me away, actually. That number of that number of, that, that size of a project is, so I used to only see that amidst the JavaScript community. You know, it's the, the Angular, or it's the React community is like that. But PyTorch is growing. And then um, I have some slides here on Chainer because I really want you to check it out if you're interested in machine learning because it's really useful and most people don't know about it. It's underappreciated because they don't have a big marketing budget. Preferred Networks is a small consulting company. They're actually fairly large in Japan, owned by Toyota, most partially. Toyota has a big investment. And they use this a lot, uh, a lot in robotics, especially. So if you're in, if you have anything around robotics, Chainer is very useful. Uh, a lot of features. I'll go into this. You can see that later. This is the code I use to explore the communities around these projects. I'll show you some results of this code. This is basically a, a SQL query that was done on the GitHub stats. Um, so you have these. You know, uh, GitHub has made their data available in BigQuery, in Google's BigQuery. And you can basically query Big, BigQuery and get some of these inform this information. Then I basically took and I weighted the different activities, the comments, the PRs, the review comments, the releases, and then close rename and label issues. I kind of gave weights to those activities and came up with a score, a weighted score for every project, um, really for each participant in their activity. And then kind of drew these empirical CDF of raw scores. Right, this is sort of the, <laughs> This, is, this shows you, uh, kind of interpret this, you have the number of, of uh, the, the score on the, on the y-axis, and the x-axis is the, the participants, right? So you can see kind of uh, the, the raw CDF, I think, is a little bit hard to interpret if you look at the normalized, so normalize them all. 
to the same uh, number of partic community participants. So normalize them to 1.0 is the fraction of the community doing, it's kind of showing you what fraction of the community is doing what fraction of the work. So a very distributed community would be flat, like a straight line would show you like everybody was doing a fair ship, their fair, fair share. A very kind of um, arc community means that a few people are doing most of the work. And uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of participants, but most, people, most of the stuff is being done by a few people. So you can kind of, it's interesting. You can see kind of PyTorch is in the middle. Uh, TensorFlow is way up at the top. So it's a big community, but there's a lot of, there's a smaller group of people that a percentage is actually doing the work. And that's, I think that's partly because it's a big community. There's a lot of interest, but that interest has to be weighed against the fact they're not all really participating. There's a lot of observers, a lot of people just kind of staring at it going, this is interesting. I wonder if I should do it, what, what will this do? Um, so that's, that's a little bit of information about um, kind of those communities. So I, uh, let's look at my time. So it's eight o'clock, so I'll probably have another 10 minutes maybe, whatever time, <laughs> however long until people start walking out because they're bored. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, basically, this, this, I, I, I want to talk a little about the journey I, I was on. I know some people know this, so I'll go relatively quickly. But it's kind of the, the recognition that the Python, that the AI and ML work today is a different place than, it was, than what it was even just three years ago. Uh, when we started um, Continuum, what the world was like then versus what the world is like today. And it's because of this broad adoption, it's because we've succeeded, like we won. Python's the number one language, awesome. And we have all this AI stuff going on, really cool. Now what, now what, what comes next? And what comes next is it's, it's too big to kind of have just a few people involved. It has to be kind of mechanized. Um, I got started really caring about this because of medical imaging. So it still holds a soft place in my heart. I was inspired by this guy, Richard Robb, who was a, he would show us episodes of Star Trek and kind of say, yeah, I really want to build a world where medicine is like Star Trek. And I thought that was pretty cool and I thought that'd be really fun. And I did, it was fun and it still is fun. But what ended up happening is I ended up spending a lot of time with data and trying to figure out how to do operations on large amounts of data quickly. And making that easier to do instead of just having to write C code all the time is what led to Python. And so I had to do five dimensional derivatives of data and I had a bunch of data sets and I was doing a MATLAB and my MATLAB work had doubles and I needed floats. <laughs> that was basically it. I needed to be able, I had too much data to fit a memory so I needed float 32s. Darn, what am I gonna do? So um, everyone has to start somewhere. And I looked around on the internet and said, what am I gonna use? Because I like MATLAB, I like to be able to think at a high level. I don't wanna write C code all the time. So what do I use? And I, I saw Yorick, I saw uh, all these open source things, Perl. Um, I didn't, I, I quickly get, they get, looked at that. I used that for my master's degree, basically. I used Perl for about <laughs> for a year, and then I went back and tried to figure out what code I'd written a year ago. I could not make hits or tails of it. Right? And so I knew that this is gonna be tough because I'd have to kind of be a Perl expert all the time. And really data science needs you to be able to not have to be an expert all the time on the coding. You need to be able to come into it kind of, okay, I'll remember a few things. It's not like you remember everything in Python, but at least the syntax itself is somewhat readable. Um, and with Python, I had the office experience. I started in 97, came back really in 98, and went, oh, I still, I still understand what I wrote. This is awesome. Okay, I'll, I'll start contributing. That's kind of what, for me, meant, meant Python. Um, I started really early, right? Um, this is a picture of Guido back when he was, before he retired. Uh, but this is one of the first PyCons. Uh, that I attended where he was there. And uh, I started at 1.4, version 1.4. How many users of 1.4 do I have in the audience? <laughs> Python 1.4, anybody, anybody? Maybe, okay, all right. Usually there's one. Two, I think. Two, yeah, Python 2, yeah. So I was so excited when 1.5.2 came out. I can't tell you how excited I was. There was a lot of real great features in 1.5.2. Uh, and uh, that's, and then, you know, the whole Python 2 thing was really cool. Uh, but all during that work, I was actually starting, I, I got hooked on making extensions to Python basically because of the contributions of Michael Miller, who was a guy at the University of, of Illinois doing work in the supercomputers there, and he just published his work. Right? And this is part of what got me addicted to open source is the fact that it was very similar to my scientific work. Hey, people publish their work, and I can look at it, and I can use it, and then I can refactor it. So the start of cut and paste programming. I was a cut and paste programmer to start. Right, it's okay, I'm not embarrassed. You can not be embarrassed too. Uh, Java got, JavaScript got started doing that. Right? It's looking at somebody's code, and so I'm not staring at a blank piece of pa paper and going, okay, how do I start? 
took his codes and, okay, I want to make a, a input to NumPy fast. And that was NumPy.io, released in June 1998. That was the very first thing I put out on the internet uh, as a contribution to the world, June um, NumPy.io. And that got me over, and that's kind of the, the next slide that I sailed over the cliff, because that kind of got me on the trip of releasing packages. Um, so 1999, SciPy merged. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of the old guard, a lot of people I still respect, and they're often, you know, often forgotten. I think Dave Beasley had a quote, or a twit, tweeter, a twit, Sorry, what is it, Twitter? <laughs> a tweet. He had a tweet that he put out um, talking about the lost years of Python and science in the 1990s. And it's true. It's something since when um, part of this was because um, the CEO of NVIDIA got up and gave this kind of a memoriam to Python data science. It's actually a little bit um, surreal, right? When Jensen and his big production, and he's, you know, if, you, if you've seen Jensen do productions at GTC, their productions. And he shows up all this cool stuff. And right there in the middle of it, he put up all my friends about there's, there's NumPy, there's Python, there's, Web, there's, there's, there's West McKinney and Pandas, there's Dask. And he talked about them as, hey, this is the new standard for data science. Oh, great. Not, okay, look behind me. Okay, what, this is usually the peak, peak Python now <laughs> as soon as you announce it. Um, but that's not going to be true. We're going to actually keep, keep, keep going. But then, you know, admittedly, Dave was like, hey, what happened to Swig? I mean, he did a lot of stuff early, and there's a lot of people. And one of the challenges is actually, it's great to get recognized, but you saw before, NumPy was a work of 630, 639 people. Like, NumPy wouldn't exist. It's, yes, there's a lot of work I did to make it happen, but it was the other people who brought what I did into the world and kept maintaining it that's really, really critical. So how do we, how do we make sure that... Um, uh, you do have to recognize where things come from, but you also have to recognize the whole group. And so that, that becomes a challenge. And back here, there's a lot of people that led to SciPy. Uh, a lot of their, their work, a lot of their inspiration, a lot of their writings, a lot of their discussions. It didn't just come from a couple of things that one person did. Uh, we put SciPy together in 2001. Eric Jones is uh, from NThought. Um, I worked with him. That's actually what brought me to Texas, is to work with him in, in, in NThought as a business. Uh, but we collaborated initially in 2001 to pull SciPy together from my modules, from my NumPy and my NumPy IO and Multipack and all these modules. And then Piero Peterson, working with him again at QuantSight, super excited, I, went, I, had to, I had to fly to Estonia to pull him out of some academic effort and have him work with me to bring SciPy to the next generation. So we're working together again on that, super excited by that. Uh, I thought Sci SciPy was what I cared about. I was just trying to create libraries for the world to use. Then all of a sudden, oh, Numeric doesn't, you know, the original maintainer of Numeric went off to do Dart, Iron Python, then Dart, and people were writing anything called Numeray. So I ended up getting pulled into writing NumPy. Right? It was really this, this, it, and it, people ask me, why did you write NumPy? I, went, I don't know. Um, it was really duty. It was sort of a sense of looking around, nobody else is going to do it, so darn. Uh, I got the potato. Uh, I had, I did not, I didn't know what it would be. I, I knew it would, I, I knew I probably wouldn't keep my job as a professor. If, especially with the letter in hand in 2004 that said, you need to spend more time on papers and less time on open source software. <laughs> that was in 2004, right? And so I'm like, 2005, I'm going, I'm gonna take this semester and write NumPy. Yeah, you can imagine in 2007, when I was up for uh, renewal, I was up, my tenure was actually up for discussion, you know, the department chair is sitting with that letter <laughs> going, what happened here? You didn't really do that. I know, but NumPy's gonna be important. Just, I know it will be. <laughs> um, so it, I, I love creating hard conversations for people. I think that's my superpower, actually. <laughs> um, what are you going to do with this guy? I don't know. Um, uh, the VCs, I do that for them, too, because I'm like, the VCs are like, How do we, i got to build an enterprise software company. Oh, we got to support the community. Um, uh, we got to have enterprise software. <laughs> And so it's kind of like, for the open source crowd, I'm kind of too market driven sometimes, and for the market driven people, I'm too open source driven. So I'm kind of like right in the middle of that. And that's good, actually. If you're not, if you're not bothering one, one side of the argument, then you probably aren't doing something right. Um, so that was NumPy. It was a large community effort after that. Like, it, it really succeeded. We succeeded in accomplishing that, but it's then the community that succeeded in bringing it to the world over the next 10 years. Um, now, fast forward 12 years later, the, we have uh, 20 array objects everywhere. Um, CNTK, uh, each one of these has an array object. You look deeper, and I think my claim to fame can be that everybody now uses the word D-type. Like, D-type was a word I, I pulled out of the air to describe the type system of NumPy, and now it's everywhere. 
Uh, so that's the only thing that really people carry over from. And then I guess the idea of organizing data as, as a tensor, but uh, it's everywhere. So we're back to this. <laughs> now we've got a bunch of arrays again, and I'm like, okay, uh, that wasn't exactly what we planned on, but now what? Uh, so we're not gonna write a new array object to unify them all again. Uh, that would be a potential idea. And it's really, it's this that's the problem to me. It's not the fact we have all these arrays, it's the fact that people are, it's like, okay, I've got this new cool thing called Sonnet. It's like, oh, is it TensorFlow or is it Torch? Do we really have to care? Do we really have, oh, it's, I gotta have a silo? It's that breaking down of siloization of libraries that is what concerns me. Not having multiple implementations, it's the breaking down of these, these standards. So there are unification efforts happening, something called Gluon, high-level shared APIs. Keras is another one I talked about, Gluon and Keras. But then we also have Sonnet. <laughs> Sonnet is TensorFlow's Gluon, basically. Um, this is an example of Gluon. Uh, Onyx, of course, Onyx is, is a nice approach because it's effectively saying, look, these are TensorFlow libraries, and I don't, if it were just restricted to machine learning training, that's great, that's fine, we can have a lot of those. And then we can have Onyx to be, one's about training, one's about deployment. What I'm worried about is actually the, it's the ecosystem. It's the fact there's PyMC3 and PyMC4, and there's, there's all this stuff you wanna build on the shoulders of giants, and you're gonna be building on the shoulders of multiple giants. So you're gonna have all these high, these, these, these uh, skyscrapers that go to the ceiling, that go to the sky, and there's no cross bridges. Like, you gotta go all the way down and then get out another building, go to another building and go up. Like, how do we avoid that? Um, that's what we're trying to fix. Uh, NVM, TVM is an ambitious plan at UW. There's a lot of interesting things here, actually, that we're learning from. Uh, I, I was at the Facebook offices talking to the team at PyTorch, and they told me about, they're, re they're relying on DLPack. So DLPack is basically the array interface, uh, kind of condensed towards, if you look at the C-struct part of the array interface that we introduced, it's actually DL, they're doing something similar here. That's fine, but this is like, again, Python 1 era. Like, you look at all these details, like, oh, that's great, that's great, yeah, we did this in 2004, now we need to, but we're not even ready for the improved type systems that are coming down the pipe. How are we gonna add posits to the world? How are we gonna add quaternions? How are we gonna add you know, new capabilities and now we can't because we don't have any way to do that easily? Um, for me, the solution is going to be actually a, taking a lesson from how we fixed the problem in the first place. And it was not just by doing NumPy, it was a fix it twice approach. If you heard the concept fix it twice, fix it twice means if you see a problem, don't just fix the proximate cause, fix the ultimate cause. Um, so we kind of tried that in NumPy, and we did NumPy. Basically, in 2006, when we wrote NumPy, also did two other things. We uh, wrote something called the Py Python buffer protocol. So extended the language in Python. I became a Python core developer and got a commit bit, basically because I wrote this PEP 3118, which took the concept of NumPy. We didn't get NumPy into Python. We got the concept of NumPy, the structure, the data structure. We effectively got DLPack. DLPack is already in Python. Um, it's called the Extended Python Buffer Protocol. A lot of people don't know about it. It's not as popular as not advertised as, most, as, people, as other things, but it's, it's, it allows data structure to share memory with each other very, very well. Uh, and that, so we did that, and we can build on that. And then we also did something called the Dunder Array Interface, which is a very simple way for any object to export itself as a, as a pointer. Uh, kind of a, another uh, DLA pack solution. Uh, so those were kind of two things, and kind of the next, uh, so my current thinking is we can, uh, we can up-level those two works. We can take the buffer protocol and extend it to something called XND, so if you look at what we're doing now, it's basically the two things we did besides just writing a unified array object, and it's doing that for the whole ecosystem. One of it is uh, XND, and the other is uArray. And I kind of put the XND slide earlier. XND is this refactoring of NumPy, it's, and it, it, but if you, if you look deeper, it's actually taking the buffer protocol of Python and making it cross-language. So it's a, it's a cross-language buffer protocol, so that anybody can get a handle of data, and then a description of that data, and I can build function pipelines on that description. It's, when you look at it, oh, there's the description of data as a D-type, the function pipeline is the generalized U-funks, is, is U-funks, is universal functions, universal functions in NumPy, and then the container is just kind of a, um, a registration mechanism. Uh, so that's XND, and then this new product, U-Array, is a way to basically construct what does it mean to be an array, and what methods do we define, and then have a, there's going to be the methods we define to, def to create an array, and then a symbolic simplification mechanism, so I can reduce expressions to their raw components to be exported to backends. Um, so it's those two pieces, and we're giving a talk at PyData DC to talk about kind of where we're at. It's just a start, it's a research project, if you're interested, let us know. Look for something useful in this direction. 
probably February, March time frame. We'll have kind of a first alpha release that we'll be talking about. And if you want to use it in production, get back with me in 2020, probably. Maybe in 2019, if you're really brave. All right, so uh, that's part of the Quantsite Labs effort. All right, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about and my you know, view of kind of how we're gonna help the, the ecosystem in the world. If you know um, anybody at MXNet, let me know. If you know anybody at, at TensorFlow, let me know. I'm pretty connected to the Facebook folks at PyTorch, so I'm gonna talk there next week. Um, but anybody else, I'm happy to talk and help to just get on the same page about how we're gonna move the, really bring the whole, uh, the whole NumPy ecosystem to uh, connect with the machine learning frameworks uh, for the benefit of everybody up else downstream. Uh, all right, thanks, folks. <laughs> Any questions? How do you take questions? Yeah, so, uh... yeah, so, uh, yeah thanks, uh, Travis. That was it. Uh, long, uh, excellent speech for us. Uh, it will encourage us to get involved with the open community and whatever interests you. So we'll just uh, do a short uh, couple of questions. Uh, we don't want to hold up uh, uh, Travis for long, but uh, yeah, so go ahead if you, are, uh, if you have any specific question. So there seems to be uh, a trend in some of these big companies to quickly iterate from a Jupyter notebook into a production type of environment. So I'm seeing that like for Netflix, they have this interact and paper mill kind of do that. Is that, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is that kind of better than going like a different route or converting it to some other code? Or That's a really good question. I think there is this emerging trend to have notebooks be the source. Right, like, and um, I, my guess is that's gonna continue. I don't think you're gonna stop that trend because uh, basically as data scientists become the do similar things to what developers used to do. It's now no, it's not the editor wars, it's the notebook wars. Like it's what is my interface to my code and my snippets of code. Uh, what'll happen is I think that currently that's not really well defined. There's a bunch of projects defining it. I think they'll become more well defined over the next five years, hopefully over the next two years. Uh, I do see that trend continuing. And I see tools around that workflow kind of emerging. Um, I think you have to be careful because there are a lot, what's happening a lot right now is people are accidentally doing this and not really aware of the technical debt they're creating for themselves and the deployment challenges they're creating for themselves. So it's, it's challenging because you're, you're a manager of a company and you're like, okay, I need to empower my data scientists, let them use the tools they're using and not just stay in their way and say, stop doing this. But there's a lot of, um, I, I, I've talked to a bunch of companies actually, and one big problem is, okay, I have my notebook workflow, great. That notebook code, I'm gonna stick that in production somewhere. You know, how, how is that gonna work? Like, has it, this been tested? Like, what, what, when do the inputs fail? When, when is, what input, which inputs cause this to fail? Which dependencies does this have? And do I have that tracked and, and recorded? There are a lot of questions that are really important if you are putting code into production. In the past, we ignored, we, we bundled those questions into, oh, portrait code from Python to Java, right? And that's how you solved it. And it did solve some of those problems, right? That now, oh, I can deploy Python. Well, did you harden your Python? So I think there's the interface, but there's also then just even code. How am I gonna put that into production? And both those questions are right now being addressed. And uh, Anaconda Enterprise is a good thing to look at, actually, <laughs> uh, that tries to help and does some work in that direction. Great question, I think, and also a good, uh, good segue to a bunch of talks that people will be talking about in the coming years. Okay. Other questions? Any other question? Maybe that was a great one. More if we have, uh, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, how does uh, the, you know, some of the big data streaming play into this? Oh, good question. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, think uh, Big data streaming is, uh, the streaming question is, a, is a, a good one. I would say that I see, um, like, URA is gonna be about chunks, right? You'll have to add the streaming solution around this somehow, right? So whether it's, um, and that is an important question to ask. I've seen in Dask, for example, like something called Stream Z, uh, but the Java world is full of pretty interesting streaming solutions, streaming answers, and I think those, uh, you can take some of those concepts and apply them in Python, you can apply them in, 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 in uh, Java. Ultimately, when you stream, you do have to have a place, like it's like I'm collecting data, collecting data, now I'm doing something with those data. So you can separate out the streaming problem to a collection problem, and then you have the same array problem you used to have. 
and then an output problem. It's just one you're, you're doing repeatedly over and over again. So it, it, it's like, so back in the day when I was a teacher electrical computer engineering, we had streaming problems too. We, you know, the, uh, we had uh, feed forward filters and we streamed that in and solved the problem. And the, applying the harness for streaming doesn't have to be an independent problem. You have to reinvent the world through streaming. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a data ingest question and then a data output ad adapter as well. So that's my, that's, that's my view on, on streaming. Important, but you have to apply those adapters. But you don't have to reinvent the world. Okay, uh, with that, I think. Uh, one more? Do you have one? I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as you want to stay. I, <laughs> so my my wife's expecting me at 10 o'clock, so. <laughs> Thanks for taking the question. Um, you said you started out at a Mayo Clinic in Medical Imaging. Yeah. Uh, do you see that SciPy is really going to gain momentum in the medical community, or are you going to switch it out to more scientific and other fields? Because the medical community now seems to be oh, I think, stalled for some reason. You know, that's, I think the medical community is going to be stalled for a number of reasons, not having really nothing to do with the software. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons I got out of medicine was actually the challenges associated with medical, uh, the business of medicine, and you know the, the politicization of that is continuing. Um, I do see with 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 machine learning driving a lot of adoption of scientific tools like advanced analytics was something that we talked about in closed circles and people and kind of embarrassed saying oh yeah I'm a quantitative scientist what now it's like all the rage everyone loves you and I think that's true for medical imaging as well like every place I've gone that does anything medical imaging they all want to do AI too and, if, and doing AI means Python and so and then they don't even know they're using sci-fi but they end up pulling it in. So I, th I see a lot of um, Python and medical imaging for the foreseeable future. I also see a lot of other languages helping. Like it's not generally just Python. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that actually. I, I, I'm hopeful that some of the recent advances that AI will actually help us with the problems of the business of medicine. And I'm starting to see some evidence of that. And so I'm kind of hopeful about you know, breaking down data silos, breaking down, down regulatory silos, helping spread information. Uh, there's a number of points we can talk about that are problematic, that are starting to get addressed by technology. So, okay, so give a big All right, thanks folks.